Laudato Jesus Christus, praised be Jesus Christ. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. I'm speaking to you today from my little domestic chapel in Lewisham, which I've informally dedicated to Our Lady, seat of wisdom. And today is the feast of the martyrs of England and Wales. The great majority of these martyrs were priests, Jesuits, other religious seminary priests. However, there were some notable laity, including the great saints Margaret Clitheroe and Anne Lyne, who suffered for harbouring priests, as the terminology was. Sir Margaret Ward smuggled a rope into the Tower of London to enable John Gerard to escape. Unfortunately, the rope was too short and it was traced back to her. Many of the martyrs were quite young men. It was typical for them to be ordained in their early 20s, and many suffered after only a short time on the mission. They were characters in their own right. At the English College, a riot nearly broke out over an argument about the appointment of the rector and the failure of the authorities to implement the orders of the Pope. Now, we naturally want to emphasise the glorious courage of our martyrs, and their daring exploits as they faced great danger. Especially during the Elizabethan period, we can be inspired by the tales of priests on the run from house to house, hiding in chimneys and ingenious holes constructed by St Nicholas Owen. But we should also remember the systematic abuse and prejudice to which they were subjected. It was necessary for the martyrs to protest their innocence of any political intentions. Indeed, the Church would not consider for beatification anyone who had become involved with political manoeuvrings. As the 16th century progressed, Catholics were widely reviled, and the black legend grew with its fantastic tales of the Spanish Inquisition and the nefarious Jesuits. We still find some echoes of this in popular presentations of history, and sadly even some Catholics are taken in by this today. Some of the dirty tricks to which the martyrs were subjected can give us an idea of how miserably lonely their fate must have been at times. After the arrest of St Edmund Campion, whenever the pursuivants run by the nave Topcliffe arrested a priest, they would allege that Campion had revealed their whereabouts. This was a horrible slander, since Campion had remained constant, a fact that was clear when the priests eventually saw his condition. St Nicholas Owen, as we've heard, suffered an agonising death after protracted torture. His torturer was under orders not to kill him, so he put out the story, the lie, that Owen had committed suicide. To my mind, one of the nastiest slanders was that alleged against St Margaret Clitheroe, She'd been arrested for giving shelter to a priest, Father John Mush. He had said mass for the people of York, and St Margaret was pressed to death, put under a door with weights uh, laid on it, and that was her punishment for facilitating Father Mush saying mass. The authorities told the outrageous lie that she was having an affair with Father Mush. Notwithstanding these ghastly physical and psychological torments, the martyrs were great characters and was, retained their spirit to the very last. And this is shown by the great number of sayings lovingly preserved by Catholics who went to witness their execution. Catholics would try to secure their bodies for burial if possible, or even dip their handkerchiefs in the blood so that they could obtain the treasure of a relic of the martyr. There's a lot of material from the speeches that the martyrs were often allowed to make before their execution. And there are so many wonderful speeches, I'm only able to give a brief selection. St Edmund Arrowsmith at his trial, accused of being a priest, didn't tell a lie, but made an equivocation. He said, I would that I were worthy of being a priest. At his execution, after going to a fellow martyr, St John Southworth, he said, be witness with me that I die a constant Roman Catholic and for Christ's sake, let my death be an encouragement to your going forward in the Catholic religion. And this theme of encouraging others was common. The night before his execution, blessed William Pattinson was put in a cell with seven criminals. He spoke with such earnestness to them that six out of the seven 
were reconciled to the Catholic Church. The authorities were so enraged by this that they ensured he was cut down from the noose before he was dead, so that he was alive when he was disemboweled. St. Anne Lyne said at Tyburn just before her execution, I am sentenced to die for harbouring a Catholic priest. So far am I from repenting that I wish I could have entertained a thousand. St. John Rigby, uh, a layman and labourer, tough, tough guy, said that his forthcoming torments were a flea bite in comparison of that which it has pleased my sweet saviour Jesus to suffer for my salvation. Blessed Philip Powell, a Benedictine monk executed in 1646, said at the scaffold, you come to see a sad spectacle, but to me it is not. It is the happiest day and the greatest joy that ever befell me, for I am condemned to die as a Catholic priest and a Benedictine monk a dignity and honour for which I give God thanks. Blessed Hugh Green, a secular priest executed in 1642, gave a sermon from the scaffold, during which, in common with very many of the martyrs, he explicitly forgave and prayed for his executioners, I forgive all the world from my heart and all those who have had a hand in my death, and I pray God give you all grace to seek him and attain his mercy and eternal glory. Indeed, the martyrs were so conscious of the eternal truths that they often expressed gratitude to those who tried them. Blessed John Wall, a Franciscan put to death in 1679, said of those who obtained his execution that they were the best friends he had in his life. Blessed William Lacey, a secular priest executed as an old man in 1582, said on his arrest, It's only paying the common debt a little sooner. We will go into the house of the Lord forever. And this is the most important lesson that the martyrs can teach us. Their keen awareness of the eternal truths made them ready for death each day. They were conscious of their own sins and constantly lived lives of prayer and penance in order to be ready to stand before the Lord. They followed the teaching of our Lord to stay awake, praying at all times for the confidence to stand before the Son of Man. Their courage is perhaps the most obvious lesson in addition to the physical torments which faced them, many of them suffered imprisonment and abuse for years beforehand. They stood firm against the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. And such constancy is important for us today when there are so many influences that threaten to undermine our moral and spiritual life. In the face of prejudice, the martyrs insisted on the truth. They didn't take the easy and fatal way out of saying that, all religions are the same, or that there are many equally valid views on any subject. In response to prejudice and lies, they proclaimed human truth. In response to errors concerning the faith, they proclaimed divine truth. They took a stand when it was most difficult and often confusing. Again, their lesson for us today is transparently clear. By following the traditional teaching of the Church, we're able to know with certainty the truths pertaining to our salvation. By serious and diligent reading, we're able to know those human truths of history and modern life that will help us to dispel the falsehoods that confuse so many people. The martyrs are a great cloud of witnesses to the faith in England during the darkest of dark ages. They kept the faith alive and their memory sustained Catholics until the penal laws were finally repealed and the hierarchy restored. We should pray to them for an increase of faith, of fortitude in the face of prejudice, and for clarity of thought in the face of confusion. Gloria Patria et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, Siguderat in Principio et Nunc et Semper, et in Saecula Saeculorum. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us.